In 2005, you wrote your book, The End of Poverty, where you basically made a very strong moral argument for eliminating extreme poverty in the world. And you've, you've made the point many times that this is an absolute moral scandal that we live in a world of enormous wealth. And yet we have such depth, such horrible uh, and soul destroying deprivation. Um, talk about, can you just talk about how you see poverty in the world today and what are the mor what's the, the moral challenge of ending poverty and what are the, the, the moral and kind of um, ideological impediments to ending poverty? Because we know that there's no financial impediment. So what, are the, what, are, what would you say about that? <clears throat> we know from uh, the history of uh, religion, law, and philosophy that the question of helping the poor has been on the table for uh, more than 4,000 years, uh, because one can find uh, already in ancient uh, Egyptian uh, uh, descriptions of the, of the role of the Pharaoh uh, or in Mesopotamian uh, laws, the commandments uh, to uh, be generous to the needs of uh, the widows, the orphans, uh, and the destitute. The idea that we should be helping in a society uh, to help those who are in destitution is a, an age-old idea. Uh, and it was an age-old idea even when everybody was poor. Uh, so now that uh, we are in a world of wealth, it's extraordinary to me that that basic idea isn't an overpowering idea. Uh, it's something I don't understand uh, about our world, our mentality, uh, our actions, because now we are in a world of such vast wealth that it would seem to me to be absolutely second nature to uh, end the extreme deprivation but ending the extreme deprivation uh, gets almost no notice, uh, except in uh, nice classes uh, or in uh, maybe uh, religious appeals, but not in practical politics. There's no sense of urgency uh, or will to it. And I've experienced this uh, repeatedly in my own efforts, even raising funds for fighting malaria or AIDS or other life-saving uh, interventions is a very difficult thing with a lot of ideological opposition. If you go back to uh, the Old Testament, by the way, it was part of Mosaic law that uh, the uh, farmer should leave the gleanings uh, of the field uh, for the poor to come collect them. Uh, it was part of Mosaic law that uh, everybody uh, gets a, a Sabbath, uh, a day off. It was part of the Mosaic law that there should be forgiveness of debt uh, in the Jubilee year. It was a repeated commandment of, uh, of, of God uh, in the Mosaic law and of the prophets to attend to the widows and the orphans and the destitute. It's uh, Jesus's fundamental claim uh, in Matthew 25 about what the day of judgment is all about. Uh, it's about he who feeds uh, the least among uh, the. So these are not new ideas. These are fundamental ideas. And yet, where have we heard in American politics one word about uh, global destitution for years? Nothing, zero. I don't mean small, I mean zero. Uh, we hear about cutting foreign aid, we hear about, uh, uh, about uh, many claims uh, about uh, shithole countries. We, we hear all sorts of things, but we don't hear a moment of sympathy, mercy, or I can say understanding because most of our politicians are ignoramuses. Uh, I know that firsthand. Uh, by my dealings with them. So this is not, uh, this is only a fact statement, not a, uh, a value statement. Uh, they don't know anything, but they have opinions. 
uh, and this is a, a big problem for us. So I find it shocking. You know, there are 500 people in the world that have a combined net worth of $8 trillion. You would think that that would be fundamental to their purpose from morning till night of saving lives. Uh, almost none of them even notices that that's an issue. Uh, Bill Gates does. Uh, he created a foundation around that. He's given billions of dollars to saving lives. The rest, I know many of them, they don't even think about this issue. Uh, and that's when you have a hundred billion dollars of uh, personal wealth. It's astounding to me what kind of uh, orientation we have. When you ask what is going on here, there's a long story. Uh, I blame it on Anglo-Saxon philosophy, but it's not only that, but uh, the Anglo-Saxon approach starting uh, in the 1500s, but not only uh, in uh, England, elsewhere as well, was that the poor are poor because they're undeserving. They're lazy, uh, they're vagrants. They deserve to be put into workhouses, but they don't deserve mercy. And so the whole idea of mercy uh, really uh, has uh, gone away. The idea of empathy. And uh, if uh, people want to be shocked, read uh, John Locke, our uh, great defender of, uh, uh, of uh, consent of the governed on the poor laws because John Locke calls for three-year-olds to be put into workhouses. Uh, absolute cruelty. Uh, and uh, that's uh, one of our lead philosophers. Uh, and when you follow this up, I would say that uh, several things evolved in our ideology. One was that the poor are poor because they are disfavored by God. Uh, so this is very much a Calvinist idea. Uh, you know, if you're poor, you're being punished. Uh, you're unworthy. Uh, of course, uh, mix in a good dose of racism uh, and uh, poverty across racial lines is uh, almost uh, devoid of uh, sympathy in uh, so much uh, of uh, the world power structure of the last 300 years. This was the time of mass enslavement and apartheid of which our country played uh, a leading role, not the only role, uh, but a leading one. Um, so that's another element. And then economists came to the idea of budget constraints, uh, which is uh, really a nasty idea that and that's what I confronted in my work as a development economist. Well, you know, if people are poor, they should maximize their uh, well-being subject to their budget constraint, and they should save more, and they should uh, get uh, better off. Of course, any deep analysis of their budget constraint would open up a, a can of worms for those who don't have such constraints, because uh, all of us uh, live off of uh, wealth created by uh, somebody else um, and by exploitation. Uh, but this idea that uh, the budget constraint is really the definition of what you should expect is pretty deeply uh, uh, entrained in our textbooks and our thinking and our sense of property rights. Um, but it's the opposite, as you know, of uh, the church's teachings, for example. Uh, one of my favorite quotations is uh, of St. Ambrose, who taught, and he's quoted uh, in several encyclicals, that when uh, the rich give something to the poor, the rich person is not making a gift to the poor. The rich person is restituting to the poor something that belongs to the poor because creation was made for everybody. This is the origin of the idea of, of the doctrine of the universal destination of goods, uh, which I wholly subscribe to. Um, so the economist idea of a budget constraint, in my view, is a bizarre idea to begin with uh, as a normative proposition. Uh, 
why should the poor have a constraint that's uh, such a constraint that they're dying of their poverty? But that is taken as given. And then there's another very basic idea, which is that whatever we do in terms of redistribution of income, that stops at the nation's border. So many people would say, yes, we should have anti-poverty programs in the US, but foreign aid, no way. And that's a very deeply held view. And it's a deeply institutionalized position because any high income country today uh, has a, a, a budget that is 30 to 50% of national income. So a lot of redistribution going on. But the same countries, when they give abroad, give 1% of GDP or less. And in the case of the United States, our so-called development aid is 0.15 of 1%. Uh, it's one sixth of 1% of US national income. And it's widely considered to be too much uh, by many of the political class. I reject this idea. I think we live in a global society. And so we should have global income redistribution. We should have global taxes that are collected to help the global destitute. So this is, uh, and then one final point, Tony, uh, which is that uh, if you bring people along far enough and they finally say, look, I'm not arguing in principle with you, but in practice, foreign aid doesn't work. It all gets stolen, which is uh, throughout history, the lazy man's excuse for doing nothing. And then I had that argument for 10 years, trying to raise money for global health. And the money finally came and uh, AIDS treatment picked up considerably anti-malaria treatment with hugely positive results. Even economists did studies. Oh, why weren't the bed nets stolen? We're very surprised because economists who, I don't even know where to start, but there was actually an NBR study expressing shock that the money wasn't all stolen because they thought their theories would have predicted that it was all stolen. Well they ought to get out of their office and get a life uh, and see that uh, you know poor people who need to stay alive don't steal everything. They uh, were very happy to get bed nets and to use them. So when all of that happened, it hardly changed anything though. Money came, then I went back and I said, you see, this is working. The global fund, which I helped to design, uh, has saved it's estimated more than 20 million lives, but that has no impact on getting the budget of the global fund properly filled, uh, even when the evidence becomes overwhelming. So the bottom line is, it's a mystery to me uh, what really goes on in our minds, our society, our neglect, our excuses, our justifications, but we are a rich world of wealth that is unimaginable. And by the way, I can tell you Forbes magazine just came out with their billionaires issue of which I am a uh, passionate reader. Uh, once a year, they uh, unveil who has what. And this year there are 2,700 people on the list and their combined net worth is $13.1 trillion. It went up $5 trillion in one year during the pandemic. You might think that they would do something, but I haven't noticed. So this is uh, where we are. It's a little bizarre. You don't need $13 trillion to get kids in school, uh, to get uh, children vaccinated, uh, to uh, end malaria. It's a few billion dollars to end malaria. We can't get it. Uh, so this is really a very deep puzzle for me, but it's a blight, it's a blot on economics because economists 
should be the first to say, here's how rich we are and how little it would cost to meet basic needs of people in every part of the world. Thank you, Jeff, for that excellent answer. I really appreciate it and really appreciate all the work you've done on this over the years. 